hello, everybody. My name is Dawn, and as, uh, as was already mentioned, I work at UC Berkeley in the Language Center as the director of the Berkeley Language Project, but I also teach French at Finnish High School, and it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thanks for the opportunity. We're going to look at how culture is infused in project-based language learning, and so let's uh, just kind of get started. So as we look at our national um, ACTFL standards, there's a, a whole strand about cultures, and you have that on screen now. The, the whole point about cultures is right out of the standard says knowing how, when, and why to say what to whom. And I would like just to point out, those of you familiar with the ACTFL um, national standards, that the recent addition has changed the language just slightly um, and it talks about investigate, explain, and reflect upon. I really want to draw your attention to that because as we talk about uh, project-based language learning, um, that's really at the heart of what we're doing, investigating and then giving students opportunity to explain back what they've learned and then to reflect upon their learning journey. And of course, the, the investigate, explain, and reflect upon has to do with not just the practices and the products of the cultures, but primarily about the perspectives. This is really at the heart of things, and what we want to talk about most today is um, the perspectives aspect of things. So, um, pressing on, we've got this beautiful graphic, thanks to the, to the Center for coming up with this. It shows you how the products and the practices relate one to another, and right at the top, tying it all together, perspectives. And so, what we know from um, from from our standards in particular is that the, 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 the three P's are are right at the heart of our standards, yes, but but the issue we're really trying to get at is how that perspectives um, refers to the ways in which cultures interpret the world. That is the ways that that cultures hold values and attitudes and beliefs in common one to another and how those can be varied from one culture to the next. So practices um, refers to those worldviews. It refers to the social interactions that occur uh, between people about those worldviews, and also the, the ways that we look at, the, at products from the culture, the way that practices uh, evolve out of the culture, those attitudes toward those things. There are cultural things, cultural artifacts. There's music, there's books, there's landmarks, there's games, there's food, there's all kinds of things that people hold in common within cultural groups. Um, but it's the perspectives that we're really trying to hone in on. Surface level things um, are, are more obvious perspectives, so a little more, takes a little more digging to get there. So this brings up a, a notion that's much in um, discussion these days in world language circles about, it's called intercultural communicative competence. And what we're raising as we talk about in this ICC, we're relating to it as ICC, some questions I've got on screen for you just to think about. Um, as you craft a project, we want to, to think about ways that we can move from products and practices to perspectives. Um, as language teachers, we're very frequently um, uh, addressing the products and the practices, it's, it's, it's students are very curious about the foods of a culture, for example, or why people do things the way they do. But getting into that perspectives area is really where we're trying to push. How can how can we help students gain cultural knowledge and sensitivity and awareness? Uh, not just not just one, but all of those. Uh, another question for inquiry for us as we build our projects: How can we create context for? transformation to move to a more global worldview. We're really um, interested in not just mere factual knowledge, but actual transformation um, in the minds of our students to embrace a worldview that is much more global uh, in view. So, um, and of course, we've, we've talked a lot about trying to have face-to-face -face conversations, cross-cultural contacts, um, trips to target cultures, um, but it's not always practical. Um, in my school, for example, it's uh, it's pretty hard to organize a trip abroad, um, partly partly because of some constraints that my district has about such things, insurance issues. But in addition to that, not many of my students really can afford to go uh, to uh, faraway places um, since I teach French, right? Um, however, 
um, we do have ways to bring the world to them. And so we're looking at authentic resources, uh, things off the Internet, like text, images, videos, and sound um, files, music files, all kinds of ways that we can bring the world into the classroom. But again, it's not just about looking at authentic resources, but digging down in deep about what those resources offer to us by way of perspectives about the culture that we're studying in addition to the student's own culture. So project-based language learning really offers um, a unique opportunity here to build, uh, sorry, went too soon, um, interactions across cultures as the students they investigate, explain, and reflect upon the relationships between products, practices, and perspectives. Again, that's a quote right out of our standards. So let's look at a little bit further. Um, you know, a whole issue about perspective, I really like this, uh, this uh, comic that Julio found for us. Um, you have these blind scientists and, and people looking at an elephant and they have all kinds of ideas. Uh, it goes back to, to the old joke that, that is around about what these blind people are gathering around uh, an elephant and they think one is it thinks it's a tree, one thinks it's a rope, one thinks it's a wall, and so on. All their perspectives are wrong because they, they haven't seen the whole picture. Um, they're tentative at best. Sorry, the bell has rung at my school, and so uh, that's in the background. So um, when we look in the research, um, there's a paper by Muller and Osborne that um, we're going to make available to you and really encourage you to read. It's an excellent read. But they talk about some models for teachers to use to organize their thinking about um, developing their learners' intercultural communicative competence. So they define this, the ICC, as knowledge, skills, and attitudes that lead an individual to both think and act in an interculturally competent manner while using the target language. And so we want to look at those dimensions, um, or we want to look at, at that. Um, here's, a, here's one way to think about it. In the first, first box, you've got all these pieces of information. And, um, and they're disparate one from another, not very well connected. And, and yet what we wanted to do is, with this information is piece it together and build knowledge schema by connecting the dots and helping, see, helping our students see the connections between, and again, the practices and the products in order to get to the perspectives. And I think that if we look at this drawing, the lines represent for us um, a good insight as to what those perspectives are in regard to the products and, and the practices. So knowledge isn't just knowing information, right? It's also about how those facts are interpreted and how they're connected by individuals in the target culture. Uh, we, we know this is true because uh, a given set of facts, um, one culture can interpret them one way and another culture might interpret them differently. We see this a lot of times and when um, our governments don't understand one another. I just think uh, not too far back about how um, the United States versus France, for example, interpreted the events of 9-11 and the misunderstandings between two really good friends, and it was just very different. So just giving the information is not enough. It's the connections between them and those perspectives that tie them together that really are important. So again, we pull out those authentic resources and and they, they look like these dots here. And we need to build um, learning activities and, and inquiry opportunities for students to dig in deeply and see what's underlying that. Ask those questions. Build further questions for inquiry. And, of course, our driving question should help lead to um, that kind of inquiry. All right. Then, then there's the matter of attitudes. Um, initial attitudes are really important in the development of um, of intercultural competence. Uh, so sometimes we have students that, are, that are, are put off by another culture. Others are, are eager and keen, and, and then many of them fall in between that spectrum. But what we want to do is promote um, in our, co our courses a respect and an openness and, and curiosity to do investigation these are important attitudes that, that we as teachers must model so our students see examples of what that looks like um, in order to then be able to imitate those and follow suit. Um, I'd like to um, 
encourage my students to ask lots and lots of questions. And, and sometimes they'll ask questions that seem a little bit off, off target, but they're questions that they're asking. And then they're going to learn, learn more by asking those questions and, and help my helping to model ways to ask those questions, perhaps in more, more, uh, more respectful ways or with bet better attitudes as someone who's more experienced dealing cross-culturally than they are. Um, they grow in, in understanding very deeply. And so uh, I really have seen great things with our students doing this. There's another study by uh, Borghetti from 2011. Again, we'll provide this for you. It recommends the affect, a, uh, activating an affective process like empathy and adaptability and flexibility is really important to promote acquisition, not just of language, but also this intercultural competency that we're talking about. And it's, it's, we've got to be cautious because we don't want to go too far too soon. The community, uh, of classroom community has to be established first. There needs to be a safe learning environment to begin with so that students feel comfortable in their context, and there's a place to begin building then these cross-cultural kinds of, um, of skills that we're trying to look at. Uh, a readiness to suspend disbelief about other cultures and a belief about one's own, it, that makes us more receptive to understand the target culture. We need to be able to step back from our own cultural mindsets and and say, I'm going to set that aside for a while while I investigate this other culture so I can understand it and in time um, perhaps come to appreciate it even more. And then we talk also about um, awareness. And there's three kinds of levels of awareness that we want to bear in mind. And firstly, there's the cultural awareness. And this cultural awareness has to do with one's own culture. Um, we don't often pause to reflect about our own cultural awareness, our cultural practices, rather. And we need to help students to, to, as we talk about, begin where they already are, tapping into prior knowledge. Um, and this includes then investigating one's own culture as a place then to know where we need to perhaps suspend or put aside for a time to be able to be open to investigate differences. But it's also in comparing to other cultures that we become more aware of our own cultural values and um, and, and thoughts about um, how we do things. So cultural awareness is certainly really critical in, in what we do um, in our language courses. Then comes intercultural awareness. And this is where we do the investigating of the similarities and differences between our own culture and the culture, the target cultures that we're looking at. Um, we really want students to have that opportunity. We want to scaffold that, perhaps. There's lots of ways to scaffold, perhaps with um, with graphic organizers connected to the authentic resources that we're looking at, guiding our students to reflect with, with um, guiding questions, um, prompts, uh, and in target language with, with sentence starters or sentence frames to help them formulate phrases in the target language so we can embed language learning in that as well. Um, but we're really wanting to uh, support our students in looking at the seminaries and differences in ways that is safe for them but also pushes them to, um, to, to, to think deeply about, about what they're learning about the other culture. And finally, self-awareness. There's self-awareness is, is a realization that when culture, culture does impact our own attitudes and when we encounter other cultures, that also impacts our attitudes. And we're hoping that that's gonna be good um, rather than negative, but when it is negative, we want to help scaffold reflection for students so that they can can dig in and analyze why they're reacting that way even so that they can um, grow in maturity to be able to suspend that or put it aside in order to appreciate the other person or the if other you're person's looking for your culture. iPod, please come up to the attendance office. Your iPod is I, in the attendance office. I apologize, I'm at my school and there was an announcement, so sorry about that. Um, so self-awareness is this third stage uh, of awareness issue with intercultural competency um, where we come to be able to be reflective then about um, the idea of culture and cultures, okay? Um, 
All right. So then, when, many of you may perhaps already be uh, oh, um, familiar with the cultural iceberg metaphor, where there's the surface level things that are really visible, and very often this is where products and practices are seen because they're much more visible. It's the perspective things that often are below the surface. And um, some of the things that we can consider are listed here, like personal space. Um, you know, I've often had to teach my students about personal space issue for French speakers is not anything like what it is for Americans. And I find that the further west we go in the United States, the more personal space seems to be the case. I don't want to overgeneralize. Of course, that depends on person, uh, the person, and, and there's subcultures all within the culture at large. But, but basically, um, the idea of personal space is, is really, really critical. Um, or concept of time. Wow, that's a, that's a really interesting thing. I grew up in a French-speaking context in California, and I had to become aware of cultural notions of time beyond my own. And I imagine many of you have also encountered things like this. There's, there's official time, and then there's, there's just time with friends. And it's very, very different. It's kind of interesting to, to think about that practice. But again, what is a perception? And, and so we want to um, help guide our students to ask questions like that about why is it like this in this other culture? What can I find out? And perhaps um, they, when they're inquiry, they'll be able to investigate you know, with the assistance of target language um, individuals who can lend some of their own perspectives to the equation. So uh, perspective gets deep. The further deep down we go, the, the closer we're getting to that perceptions notion, that the perspectives of things. Um, and it can be really, really challenging to go deep. And especially as we remain in target language, we want to, um, it, it, it becomes even more challenged. So this becomes a question. And to what degree are we going to provide opportunities for our students to do reflection in their own first language about the, their own culture as well as the culture of the target language that they're studying so that they can actually achieve this intercultural competency? I would argue that there's a time and place for that. Um, even within our actual statement, we aim at a 90% target language range. That 10%, we don't want it to be just school announcements and, and bulletin reading and, and things like that. We want to get down deep and um, give our students opportunity to do some, do for some reflection uh, uh, in their own language about these deeper concepts um, and so that they can benefit from, from uh, intercultural competency um, at a deeper level. I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit there. I hope that is clear. I apologize. So just um, going down further then, we're also looking at, at, um, at skills. And so intercultural competency skills involve interpreting and relating as well as discovering and interaction. We want students to be able to interpret authentic documents of various kinds. Again, that I'm going to call that multi multimedia. It doesn't have to be just printed text. It could be video. It could be, it could be um, uh, uh, music. It could be poetry. It could be paintings, sculptures, whatever kinds of things that they're looking at as authentic resources out of the culture, um, we want to go, go deeper and give our, the opportunity to be able to interpret those authentic resources and events. The discovery interaction level is the ability to acquire new knowledge of a culture and its practices and then how to manage that new knowledge of a culture and its practices. So intercultural competency researchers, they've been uh, they've defined these skills this, these, in these two categories. And so just to um, kind of pull it together a little bit more, in, interpreting and relating has to do with the ability to interpret in a document or an event or an authentic resource. And the skills of discovery and interaction has to do with the ability to acquire that new knowledge and to be able to manage that new knowledge. So... 
what are the connections to project-based language learning for intercultural competency? And I think that at this point, I'm hoping that's becoming really, really clear that that even as our actual standards talk about now um, the the investigating and the explaining and the reflecting, project-based learning, learning builds in all of those kinds of opportunities. PBLL is a constructivist approach to learning. It deals with real-world products. That is, we're trying to help students create things that are real-world, uh, really useful, really needed within the target culture. Um, it also um, gives students really unique opportunities to learn about the target culture. Yes, we're aiming at them acquiring language, but the cultural content is, is absolutely essential. We want these products that they're making um, to be culturally appropriate, and, and there's a lot of sophisticated understanding culture that's needed for that. I'm going to give an example of a project in a moment that I think pulls all this together. Um, project language learning affords learning opportunities for, for both learners and instructors alike. I, don't know how, how um, far you've gone with PBLL yet, but I've been doing this for a number of years. And honestly, I must tell you, I have, um, I have learned a huge amount from my students um, in project-based language learning. Okay, it's... Uh, and, then, and then the facilitation, um, creation of an environment where the traditional roles of learner and instructor are blurred or even reversed but again, this is what I'm talking about is that um, I have learned a lot from my students as they have discovered things and shared those things. And my job is to help guide them toward the resources, help ask questions, help dig in deeper. So um, there's a couple ways, a couple main ways to infuse culture into project-based language learning. Firstly is to focus on the culture as as the main point of the project. In this kind of case, students uh, play the role of anthropologists studying the culture, and they, they produce a product that is actually an artifact out of the culture. And uh, you had the example of the Dia de los Muertos project in the last module. That's an example of that. But we're wanting to go a little bit further here and embedding culture in projects in this way. Like, we're looking at a content with a content area focus that the project would be more of a social sciences kind of a thing, perhaps an, an ecology theme or food and nutrition, global hunger type project, where the focus is on a content area. And then we've got culture embedded as well as language learning objectives embedded within it. And so the teacher guides the students to toward discovering um, cultural knowledge with authentic resources as they do research to build, build their final product connected to the theme chosen. Um, I'm going to come back again to an example in a moment where, where I think this will become much more clear. Then in terms of assessing, there's process-oriented assessments and there's multi-dimensional type assessments. So, so process-oriented assessment, it's really um, represented by assessing practices like, with like portfolios or formative evaluations. This is in the course of the unfolding of the project and students working through it. We're kind of checking in where they're going, how things are going, um, and so on. But the multidimensional assessment kind of, uh, approach entails use of assessment tools that give teachers deeper information from many perspectives and at various stages of the project. We know that students grow over time and we want to measure where they have been and where they are and where they're going and, and have that sense of the progress and the growth over time. We want to bring in multiple modalities, make sure that, we, um, that we're addressing all the kinds of learning styles of our students as well as their particular needs. And I'm mindful of this, too, that this approach offers opportunity for differentiation of instruction with multiple measures. Um, we want to kind of think about um, our communication uh, standards, interpersonal, interpretive, and uh, and presentational modes, something similar to that in the sense that as I engage with students, I want to ask them interpersonal type questions about their observations, allow for them opportunities to interpret and express that, as well as give them opportunity to present that 
and I'm going to measure how they're doing along the way and provide them opportunities for reflection about each of those things. So project-based learning gives, gives teachers a really rich structure to implement both process-oriented assessment and this multi-dimensional kinds of assessment. We don't want to think of assessment as just simply one summative thing at the very end, but rather that there's opportunities all along the way and of various kinds. Projects always consist of several tasks to operate in, in, in concert one with another to help the learners um, provide the answers to their driving question. And so, in other words, that the, the project gives a context it gives all those who all the tasks that they're that they're undertaking some kind of coherence, and it creates multiple opportunities to assess the the cultural knowledge. Um, and since projects are sequence of articulated tasks, step by step from one thing to the next toward a common goal that is answering that driving question, they give lots of opportunities for teachers to implement these multi-dimensional types of assessments that we're talking about with a variety of tools, a variety of perspectives along the way. All right, now let's see. So this um, graphic helps us to um, see the different kinds, so several different kinds of ways of looking at, at assessment. Performance assessments, yes, peer feedback, self-evaluation, Again, peers involved in the process along the way, teacher observations, reflection is key, and the target audience is also going to have opportunity for some feedback. So I want to give you an example uh, project that I did a while back um, that I think kind of pulls together these various things. My students had a, their driving question was this, how can we create literacy development storybooks for kids in Senegal? Um, as I mentioned before, I teach French, and so I was looking for opportunities for my kids to connect to a French-speaking um, uh, public audience. And I was in touch with a Peace Corps worker working in Senegal and on literacy development, among other things, in a, in a rural community. And uh, and she needed she needed materials, and so I, I expressed the, an interest to work with her. She was keen for that. My students were really excited about it. So we, we made books. We made books. And, and um, the students, uh, they, they had opportunity to connect with the Peace Corps worker, to pose questions, to ask, ask about you know, what the needs were, what kinds of stories might there need to be. They wanted to have stories that were embedded in cultural contexts that were relevant to the students who were going to read those books. And obviously, there was a whole lot of linguistic content that was essential for the storytelling, um, just making sure that things were labeled well and in cross-cultural contexts. The need to know was obvious. It was a real-world situation, and there were a lot of emails going back and forth between us and, and our Peace Corps worker. We had an opportunity to set up uh, a Skype exchange a couple times as well so that we could do some video conferencing and asking and answering questions to gather information and, and go deeper. Students had a lot of opportunity for voice and choice. They were writing the stories. They were illustrating the stories. Some of them were artists and did drawings. Others asked for photographs to include in the books from, from uh, overseas. Um, we had opportunity to share drafts with our friends in Senegal, and they sent us back um, some, some input. We are also paired with a class in Marseille in France and, and sent some things to them as well and asked them what they thought about the language content, what they thought about the stories, were they compelling, were they interesting, what they thought might be helpful. So we elicited engagement by um, these group of students in France to help us with this. And there were lots of opportunity for critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and so on. Um, obviously, the public audience was the kids in Senegal themselves. So I think this, this project addresses this, uh, the, the idea we're trying to get about in, in, in infusing cultural context. The content was really dry, driven by this um, driving question. How can we create literacy development storybooks for kids in Senegal? We learned about how to make books. We learned how to ship them. We learned how to deal with um, it's getting them overseas and, and, and on and on. Um, and so 
I guess I'm coming full circle. What I would say by by kind of a summary statement at this point would be this: that intercultural competency has to do with our students becoming self-aware at multiple levels about their own culture, but also about the cultures of the world with, with which they're interacting, uh, not just in the target culture uh, and the target language, but also in the lang their own language uh, as they reflect along the way. And so um, I think at this point we can go to some questions. What do you think, Stephen? Hi, Stephen here, and yes, I think we're ready for questions. Jim uh, has some ready for us. Excellent. Okay, um, hold on. The first question is, uh, can you talk more about the distinction between acquiring and managing cultural skills? What is an example of managing a cultural skill? Okay, that's a really good question. I'll do my best to get at that. Um, I think acquiring is, is has to do with with just you observe the patterns of of uh, the ways people interact. Management managing is is the thinking that goes along with it. In other words, we 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 see what's happening. We see products. We see practices. We see the ways that people interact, and then we step back from that and we reflect about how that happens and why that happens and. And it becomes part of our own uh, more broadened worldview. So the so the management has to do with our thinking um, at that deeper level, reflecting upon uh, upon what we've observed. Okay. Um, the next question is: How can we integrate culture to language learning for beginners? Sometimes it's harder for beginners than at advanced students to produce language with cultural perspectives? Yeah, so I, that's, a really, that's a really great question. Um, so it's always a challenge at novice level um, to give uh, target language authentic resources and expect students to um, reflect upon them at, at very sophisticated levels of, of um, thinking. And so a couple of ideas for me. One is, as I made the case earlier, we have that 10% range where we can, when we we're trying, if we're trying to aim at the 90% um, use of target language, 10% um, there is totally legitimate to use in students' home language. And so I think that one thing we do is we give students significant opportunities to reflect upon in their own home language about the things they're learning about culture. Secondly is um, another core belief we have about authentic resources is that we, we don't adapt um, the, the resource to the student, but rather we adapt the task to the student, uh, student's competency range in dealing with the authentic resource. So I might, and of course I'm not going to give them a, give my French students a play by Moliere. I'm going to give them um, menus and, and road signs and, 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 and videos that are, you know, not too, too highly sophisticated, but I still want them to be authentic. I still want them to be authentically real, out of the target culture, for the target culture, uh, to for target culture audiences. So I'm going to adapt, adapt um, uh, activities and strategies to help them decipher what's going on in those texts. In, in the actual IPA, um, in Integrated Performance Assessment um, Tool, for example, um, we're encouraged to use authentic resources and actually even give questions in home language it, for interpretive tasks. So they may have a reading, but we're going to give them questions in, say, English, or in my case, Spanish very often, for my students to use to decipher what's going on in the text. So I think there's a, those are a few strategies that come to mind. Okay, here's the next question. Uh, when we integrate culture to PBLL, how do we deal with students, if there are any, who are sensitive to the topic of projects uh, without compromising the goal of the project? Um, and 
Okay. It says, do we modify the project? So, um, if I'm understanding the question right, and if not, please ask again, okay? Um, I don't, I wouldn't modify the project, but I would ex expect there's going to be a range of performance abilities from my, my students. And so, um, I'm going to be measuring them along the way and scaffolding the project along the way, uh, not just linguistically, but also culturally. I'm going to design some activities, some journal rights and so on to sort of measure where they are at various points. And, and I'm also going to respond to those things. So I'll give them a journal entry about, I don't um, I'll provide in the project briefcase, um, a whole host of of authentic resources on a theme connected to the project overall and give them a journal entry to reflect upon what 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 patterns of culture cultural um, practices and perspectives and products do you notice among all these things and what do you think about that what do you observe what is how do you see your thinking evolving over time is that what the question's about I'm not sure if I'm under, I've answered the question well, so I'm just asking if I've answered that question, is that what, what was being asked? Yes, the person who asked the question said, yes, that's helpful. Okay. Um, we had uh, some questions uh, related to the projects that you were talking to, the French project and the Senegal project. Uh, people were wondering, what was the proficiency level of the students in those particular projects? Okay, well, that's actually the same project. Um, the Senegal project, it was books for um, developing literacy in the target uh, culture in Senegal for French speakers or students in school where they, the schooling is done in French. So it was the same, um, same project. And in that case, it was um, an intermediate level fluency. It was my level three French class. And um, they were making books for kids in first, second grade range. And so um, they were aiming at storytelling at the um, with with complex sentencing at the as kind of a benchmark um, linguistic output. Okay, and uh, one final question: um, Could you please give me an ex? Hold on. Uh, can you please give me an example to understand the relationship among the three P's that you mentioned? The relationship between the three P's. An example? Is that what it was? I'm sorry. Correct. Um, uh, an example to help understand the relationship among yeah. the three P's. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I'll try to pick something close to home. My family is French Canadian, so um, some products within with my cult within my culture. We do a lot of cooking with, of course, a lot of cooking. And, uh, and maple, maple syrup is a big deal to us, and so there's a lot of maple-flavored stuff. And so, um, and, and as a family that emigrated to California from Quebec, my grandparents came here, and I was raised by them in a French-speaking home, there was a lot of fond affection for what they left behind while having chosen still to come here. And so there a lot of cooking, there's a nostalgia for products of the culture, uh, in various foods that my grandmother would prepare and they would be part of our traditions and celebrations. And so the, the product might have been various cooking things like maple sugar pie and, and uh, various kinds of cheeses and, and cherry wine for New Year's Day. Um, that's products. And in terms of, of uh, perspectives, that has to do with um, with with uh, the ways that we behave when we have a meal, so or practices, excuse me, practices. So we we'd have this meal, but there were ways you sit down to the meal together, and and typically you sit down about twelve thirty in the afternoon, and you're there till five five thirty six in the evening, and you're having one dish at a time, and there's an awful lot of talk and a little bit of eating and a lot of talk and a little bit of eating, but the perception of all of that has more to do with family values than it has to do with the foods or the ways that we sit at table together and use the time. It has to do with the intimacy of the family relationships, what we share in common, how we live together, how we hold our space together, how we enjoy our company one with another, the things that 
my grandparents would tell by way of story and passing on to me cultural identity that um, that is very much at the heart of who I am. Um, that's the perceptions aspect of things, our values, our cultural heritage, um, and, and the things that we hold important and dear. Thank you.